Well, first thing I've got to tell you is I just won the back the, the competition for best background. Um, no matter what efforts you went to, this is real. I'm sitting in the Royal Gallery of the House of Lords. So just because I thought I'd bring a bit of class to the to the occasion. Um, most significant intellectual to emerge from the sexual puck. Jeffrey, could we just just take that hell of a moniker and just re to refer to you as most significant intellectual. It seems like something that would have been awarded on by some organi a lefty organization in the 60s. So it seems to me to be uh, uh, the, the, right, the, the right thing to do. Um, we're gonna go on a journey between worlds this evening as encapsulated in this book. Go and buy it, everybody. That's the point of us having this evening's session. Um, but um, I want you to tell me, for a starter, who is this handsome devil on the front and how did this image come about? The honest truth is I can't remember who took uh, the photograph, but it is uh, a picture from the 1970s when I was active in the new Gay Liberation Front. Um, and... I suppose it shows me at my most militant, which is why in the end it uh, was chosen. But if I could just say something about the cover generally, um, because in a sense it sums up a lot of the book. Um, the picture was actually chosen in the first place by my partner, Mark, who thought it was typical of me. I was actually <laughs> reluctant, but what happened was I was asked to select a number of photos of myself to go on the cover. And Mark and I uh, discussed which ones. I was gonna leave this out, but Mark insisted that it should go in. And I'm glad he did, because in a real way, it sums up uh, a lot of the book, especially the influence of gay liberation on me. But the other thing is the back cover, um, which um, is a picture by Mark himself. And I loved this from the start. Um, because it uh, it shows me between worlds in a sense. It was on a staircase in a museum in in Mexico, um, and I've always loved the mixture of light and shade and the hint of mysterious passages upwards. Um, and unbeknownst to me, um, when Mark did this, he put it on Flickr and called it Between Worlds, um, and it was completely. Accident that I came up with the same title because it uh, made sense of what I was trying to do. Look at my own life living between quite different and apparently contradictory worlds. And I wanted to show how I lived those different worlds and I hope made um, in the end a sense of reconciliation between them. So we're talking about um, a very profound journey um, and I wanted to tell you something else that happened accidentally. Um, a couple of days before I received your book um, I happened to be in South Wales, not a, not a usual thing for me. Um, I'd been off having a short break and I did something which might seem a bit weird. Um, I went to Aberfan and I went to Aberfan because I am the age I am, and that's the same age as them. And for all of my life, those images and so on have been in my my consciousness. And like everybody else, I'm scarred by it, and it'll never leave me. But I must admit, I had never been into the valleys before, and I had never fully understood. I've heard about the valley. I had never understood the geography of the valleys, the topography of the valley, and how they are. Uh, for me, I came in Scotland, I think about glens, but no, these are small valleys in which tight-knit communities exist on the side of the hills and so on. So take us to the start of the journey um, and take us to your, uh, through your early years, very briefly, to when you came to London. Okay, well, I was born in Porth, um, at the edge of Porth, in fact. But Porth is the um, small town which is at the junction of the two Rhondda valleys. And the Rhondda, um, when I was growing up, and I think still historically today, was seen as the classic mining valley in Wales. Um, before the First World War, it was the valley of coal mining. 
the South Wales coal field was the largest producer of coal in the world, and it largely fueled the um, the warships of the Royal Navy uh, up until the war. So it had a classic place um, in um, uh, British history, um, and had strong links also globally through that. So I grew up in this small, quite isolated physically, geographically um, town, and yet it had these global links and this history. Um, and in particular, it had a history of, of labor militancy. It, in many ways, it was the birthplace of the labor movement, which from the 20s until the 1950s was a major player in British politics as a working class place. So I grew up in this small village. Um, in, a loving, in a loving family. In a but, incredibly loving family. But um, very much feeling different. That's the major thing. Um, and it taught me a lot of things in my later life. I was loved. I was cosseted. I couldn't have been more looked after. And yet, from an early age, I felt quite different. Um, and it took me years to work out what this difference was. But by my early teens, it was obvious that my difference was I was a little sissy boy. Um, and in the um, structures of the valley, the family structures, the gender structures, you're either a man or a woman. And there was me somewhere in between, not recognised fully as a girl, because I wasn't, but not recognised fully as a little man. And that sense of difference, originally in gender, by my mid-teens, had become, in a sense, sexualized. And I realized my difference was also about my different sexualities. I didn't have the language to describe that at the time. I wouldn't have called myself gay because the word wasn't used. The word that eventually came to me was queer. So from the mid-teens, um, which is by this time, um, 1960s onwards, I was seeing myself as queer. Not fully understanding what that meant in sexual terms, but sure that I had sexual destiny, which was different from what was expected of me. So I have to say to our audience here, was, as we're going on our journey with uh, uh, with Jeffrey, um, we will come to a point where we're having questions from you. So, so please do think about the questions you want to ask and, and put them in, in the chat. Flick forward to the fact that, like many of us of our age, you um, you got to go to university, uh, and that was a profound uh, change. What take us through your university very quickly, and into your coming to London? Yeah, um, in a real sense, my going to university was planned by me as an escape from the claustrophobia the loving but ignorance of my life that I experienced. So coming to London was hoped for by me as a liberation. This is where I'd be able to explore my sexuality, even though I knew nothing about the sexual scene and what I'd encountered. Um, and I went to University College London to read history, um, and that was one destiny. Um, but also I began tentatively and then voraciously to explore the queer scene that then existed in London. And this was the second time, I suppose, when I realized I lived between different worlds. The first was the difference between my secret life in the South Wales Valleys and my outward life as a child of a working class family. This was a different split world between the university world where I made friends and got to know lots of people, but never dared mention my sexuality and the sexual world I was beginning to explore. Um, so so you, you mentioned that, that queer scene, describe it to some of us. I mean, I think some people on this call probably were there. If they were there, I'm not sure they rem remember it. We're talking about the 60s and 70s, um, but some of us weren't there. So describe it to us. Well, the uh, the queer world of London was certainly the biggest in the uh, British Isles at that period, um, as it's remained. It was quite an old world in many ways. The queer world had uh, existed in London since the 18th century, at least. 
the significant thing about it is that it was in a la the language I learned later, it was incredibly closeted. Um, it was a secret world. It was a furtive world. There were hundreds of thousands of people involved in it, um, both um, uh, queer men and queer women. But they were different worlds, the queer worlds of men and women. Um, and there were different worlds within the queer world. There was the posh one, which often used the word gay. There was the working class, which never used the language of sexual difference at all, but there were players in it. And then there were the people like me on the verge of becoming middle class, working class backgrounds, who felt alienated from that world, wanted a different, more open world, and began to see ourselves as distinctive personalities in our own right, demanding our own rights. And in 1967, there was the uh, partial decriminalization of male homosexuality, um, which was presented as a great liberation, um, and which I didn't experience at all as a liberation. So a gap developed between um, what the official world was now telling me, that I was legal over the age of 21, um, as long as what I did was in uh, private, that means no more than two people. Um, but I felt completely alienated from it, dissatisfied with it. I made some queer friends. Um, I became a teacher. Um, I was beginning a career of sorts, but I felt that this isn't what I wanted. And it's at that point that I encountered the Gay Liberation Front in 1970. So tell us about 1970, Gay Liberation Front, and 1972, 50 years ago, that first Pride March and all of that. Tell us about the explosion of uh, queer culture at that point. Well, it was literally an explosion in my life. Um, I... I just started in October 1970 um, a job at the London School of Economics. Completely coincidentally, that was almost exactly the same time as a meeting was called um, of the Gay Liberation Front in London. Now, the obvious inspiration of this was the Stonewall riots in the States a year before um, and the uh, emergence of new gay organizations, including especially the Gay Liberation Front. So I picked up a notice in the canteen, which said there was the first meeting. I couldn't go to the first few meetings, but by early November, I was ready to go. I was a bit scared. This is the place I worked. The meeting place was exactly opposite the, op the office I had. Um, so I was a bit scared going to a gay meeting in the place I worked. Very respectable job um, at that stage. Um, but I went, and that was the night that changed my life completely. Um, because here for the first time, I was in a mass meeting. By that time, there were dozens. Within weeks, there was hundreds. Eventually, there were thousands going to these meetings. Um, and here for the first time, um, I was in a meeting um, with other openly gay and lesbian people uh, and trans people, people I'd never encountered um, in my life except one-to-one. -one. Here we all were together. Um, and when, within weeks of that, uh, my politics had changed, my appearance had changed, my sense of identity had changed. For the first time, I called myself gay. Um, and I also, there for the first time, um, developed a one-to-one -one relationship with my first partner, Angus Sutty. So everything changed overnight. Within three months, I was living with gay friends um, and active every night in the Gay Liberation Front, um, leafleting, discussing um, this and that, going to gay days, going to parties. It was a complete transformation of my life. Um, and I felt for the first time I was able to be what I wanted to be, openly gay. You're also able to be something that you have always been, and that's a historian. 
Um, there's an absolutely brilliant bit in your book where I, I discovered this when I went back to read a particular part of it over again while I was doing my preparation. There's a wonderful admission of yours that one of your favourite things to do was to invent countries. You invented country and not only did you invent countries, you invented their whole history, their royal family and everything. What a fantastic thing to, to, to do. But you were and you always have been a historian. And so tell us about how your historian took over in the midst of all this hedonism and began to begin theorising along with the partying. The, um, the anecdote you, you, you quote um, was absolutely true. I, I was, uh, but it was also a secret thing where everyone else is out playing football or whatever. Um, I was staying at home drawing islands, maps, um, and doing inventories of historical events. This is from the age of 12 or 13. Um, but the thing about it was I didn't tell a soul. Um, my secret hobby was as deadly a secret to me as my queerness. It was something I didn't talk to, to anyone. My family, I suppose, realised what was going on because I was always asking for bits of clean paper to do these maps. But no one in school, not even my closest friends, ever knew. Um, but I was a bit of a nerd in school. I was the historian in every class. My hand was always floating up uh, to answer questions. And of course, this just accentuated um, the, the rest of the classes despising of me. I wasn't only a sissy boy, I was also a nerd and a teacher's pet, as they saw it. So I had to be careful. I went to university to read history. Um, and the history I did was the history of political thought, which may seem fairly esoteric, but I've always been interested in ideas. I got involved in gay liberation, as I said, and it seemed natural to me that I should look at its history. How did gay liberation emerge at that point? What had happened to queer people in, in the past? How did we develop a sense of identity? Um, so this is a way for me of combining my interest in, in ideas, the idea of gay liberation, the idea of sexual identity, but also um, of doing something useful for the moment, the movement. As I said, I was involved in demos and gay days, discos, um, which were at that point were political events because it was actually illegal for um, people to touch each other if more than two people were present. <clears throat> so um, everything I was doing in a sense was um, political. Um, and I thought I'm going to do historical work on our movement. That's how I can contribute best to the movement. I couldn't for the life of me um, do street theatre. Um, I wasn't wonderful as a street militant, but I thought this is something useful I could do for the movement. And that's how it started. The history of our movement, that's what I wanted to do. And that became uh, the subject of my first book coming out. Some of us do jazz hands, some of us do footnotes. You know, there's room for everybody. Um, you, via these uh, obscure, sort of varying journals and organizations, historical journals, you meet up with people like Mary McIntosh uh, and so on, who are beginning to go into the universities and develop this, uh, this new vein of studying um, the sociology and history of, of, of gay people. So tell, take us through some of that. Yeah. Um... I, um, amongst the first people I met actually um, at my first GLF meeting and became friends for life with were people like Ken Plummer, um, who became a leading professor of sociology at Essex University, um, people like the cultural historian Elizabeth Wilson um, and Mary McIntosh. Mary was about 10 years older than me, but she had in the 60s begun exploring the sociology of, uh, um, of homosexuality, of queerness. And she was a pioneer in this. The work she did wasn't well known at that point, but I read her 
early essays and they inspired me to go further on this. They gave me a structure which I could begin to make sense of and make sense of the historical research I was doing. At the same time as this was going on um, and my academic work was developing, I became involved in uh, um, a, a socialist gay journal, uh, Gay Left, and I was a member of the collective on that for five years in the latter half of the 70s. Now, the crucial thing about that was that it gave me an opportunity not only to edit and do political work around gay socialism, um, but also to write. Um, we wrote most of the journal ourselves. The uh, editorials were always written collectively, so I learned how to work with others in collective writing. But I also began to publish reviews of books on, that interested me and my first explorations of what eventually went into coming out. And that was another transformative um, experience because um, I was not only beginning to write history, um, I was also beginning to write about politics through gay left. Um, and the two don't seem as, to my mind, um, as different as they might be um, as they were seen at that time. History was terribly conservative. Um, and uh, um, of course the left journals didn't talk about homosexuality. So by doing the beginnings of my historical research and writing in a, um, a political journal around gayness and socialism and radical change, I was able eventually to develop a sort of distinctive approach, I suppose, which combined historical insight and political sensitivity and ability to take arguments forward. Um, in the book, chapter five is the really big academic part, the, uh, the battle between different schools of thought, um, which I think we should leave it for people to read that chapter, to go into all the brilliant detail that there is in there um, but what I if I was to summarize that I think what you were trying to do um, was in the midst of everything that was going on feminism separatism all sorts of new ideas coming along was to try to give our community some kind of historical perspective well to give our to give to give LGBT people a historical perspective on that word, community, wasn't uh, Well, the idea of community was absolutely central uh, to what I was doing, because uh, in a sense, my whole life has been about the search for community. Um, I grew up in a very tight community, which didn't quite accept me. I came to London looking for a queer community and didn't quite find it. I got involved in gay liberation, which in a sense created a new sense of, of community. So the idea of community was very important to me. Um, and my first piece of academic world, work um, for a thesis was called The Search for Community. So it's been an obsession. And I still write about community all these years uh, later. Um, the crucial thing about history was I was trained as a, a, a political theorist, a historian, a political theorist, uh, um, political theory. Um, I wanted to go further by exploring uh, queer politics and queer history. Um, but the existing history didn't allow me to do it. So that chapter you mentioned um, was an attempt to explore my journey through all the challenges of being a historian of sexuality. Um, and the crucial thing was I wrote Coming Out, published in 1977, um, and it made my name, but it ruined my career because no conventional historical department, history department, wanted me. Um, I never got a job in a history department. Um, so I needed to write that chapter to show how I transmuted from um, um, a fairly traditional historian into becoming um, what I say in the book, a 
sociological historian or a historical sociologist. In other words, I found a home in sociology that history didn't provide for me. Um, and um, that was crucial to my development because it brought new intellectual influences, new theories, um, and new circles of people who were actually interested in my work and able to encourage it. And at the same time, I got involved in a radical history journal, um, history workshop journal, made very close friendships there. And again, what was crucial about that was that it was prepared to break the bonds of traditional history. It wanted to explore history um, in, in new and different ways. And in particular, listen to the voices of those who'd been denied by history, the voices of the oppressed. Um, and it was automatic in a way to find a place there for the sort of work I was doing. And in fact, my first academic article was published in History Workshop Journal. So the 70s, when all this was happening, was a period of incredible intellectual turmoil, turmoil of personal change um, and of seeing a way forward to what had seemed a lively political engagement, but a, a narrowing career opportunity. And by the end of the 70s, I was beginning to identify myself as a sociologist. The importance of that you was came about because of something that couldn't have been foreseen, and that was HIV AIDS hitting in the 1980s. And the work that you had done about defining intimacy and relationships and community and just beginning to describe it really came to the fore when HIV hit the community uh, uh, as it did. Um, it's been a very, very funny old year what with It's a Sin and the discussions that that has sparked off with very much younger people about what it was like to to live through that and you draw stories uh, of people that you people that you knew we all had we all lived through it in in the early 1980s but you you put those individual stories into um, a, a context of people forming alternative families and, and and so on and I think that's a really important thing to have written uh, to hand on to future um to, to, to future generations. Um, so get to 2001, same-sex intimacies. By now you're working with other people like Brian Heafy. Brian Heafy was very important to the uh, the foundation of, of, of opening doors because he did some of our, uh, the, original, uh, the original work of interviewing what by that time were older people who's in the in the LGBT world who who had whose stories had not been told. So in a way, there was a. Do you think there was a logical progression to that in your subsequent involvement? Well, at the time, it didn't seem like that. And um, by the end of the nineteen seventies, of course, there was um, what to me was obviously a darkening climate with the beginnings of Thatcherism um, and a distinct hostility to homosexuality, uh, to the gay revolution, to queerness. And it was at precisely that point that the AIDS, the HIV AIDS epidemic began to emerge. Um, and I happened to be in San Francisco in August 1981, when the first reports of mysterious lesions and cancers amongst gay men appeared. Um, right. So um, in a sense, I was, there without knowing it from the beginning. Um, and it inevitably changed the work I was doing. Um, and my first partner, uh, Angus, um, contacted uh, HIV in the early 80s and eventually died of it in the um, early 90s. So it's a very personal thing. I wasn't just studying it as a social scientist. It was my life. I was exploring and I wanted to write things which were relevant to that. Um, so that was a crucial turning point um, in, in everything. But it also had a peculiar effect, um, um, an intended effect, an unimaginable effect, really. It made the sort of writing I was doing 
more or less respectable because by the end of the 80s, um, the powers that be wanted more information about the queer world. They wanted to know about identity. They wanted to know about the roots of transmission. They wanted to know what loving relationships were. So I found for the first time in my career that I had new opportunities to do research um, and with funded research. Um, and one of the things I was able to do was look at um, same-sex relationships as loving relationships, as alternative families. And that's the book, eventually became the book with, uh, with Brian and Catherine um, on um, same-sex intimacy. So it was a product of the 80s, um, and but it's published um, um, after that, a project of the 90s, sorry, but reflecting back on the 80s and was published just at the turn of the millennium. Now, the crucial link is with HIV and AIDS is that out of the crisis um, came a new perception in the queer communities themselves, but also, I think, much more widely, um, that we couldn't, re they we couldn't understand our lives unless they understood the nature of our relationships and in particular, the way in which society devalued our relationships. And what Brian, Catherine and I wanted to do in our research was revalue our relationships and so show how the, what someone called the queer construct family was actually a viable, real alternative family. So that was the inspiration of the book. And the link between HIV and that, the direct link, was that uh, the experience of, uh, of uh, queer people in the epidemic made vivid for the first time the need to have recognised um, relationships, not necessarily marriage. Um, me and Catherine and Brian were actually uh, personally opposed to it at that time, but the recognition that without legal recognition of same-sex relationships, we couldn't possibly aspire to full unequal citizenship. Um, and that's what we explored in same-sex intimacies, the way in which people created um, powerful supportive networks and the way in which um, they, we, um, were developing new demands for equality um, and for recognition. We have, um, uh, and you now have the very wonderful Mark McNestry as your as your long term partner. Um, hello, I'm sure Mark's uh, watching this tonight. We, you, you and I are coming to the end of our uh, allotted time, and I want to leave time for people to ask questions. Um, but I want to um, finish this journey, which we started back in the Rhondda and South Wales, and I want to, to finish it. Um, last Saturday. Last Saturday, um, there was Trans Pride March. And I must admit, getting old these days, I didn't do the march, but I, I went to the event. And I ended up sitting uh, in the park with a number of people, people like Lisa Power and so on that you might know. And uh, we were sat on a bench and on the next bench, along came uh, some of the members of GLF and some people from opening doors. So the old gang sat there doing some of the things that they all did in the 1970s um, and handing out leaflets to all these young people. And I take you back to the point that you said, back in 1970, there were trans people, there were lesbians, there were lesbians, that we were a bunch of people who had been flung together and in truth, didn't really know that much about each other, but we built some solidarity. And I think that I was meant to read your book right now uh, over these weeks, because I think that more than ever, those of us who perhaps thought that the progress of our community would be linear have been calling to question that. And it is time for us to go back and to learn our history and to learn the history of what made our community strong enough to grow um, and not to let that disappear. Would you agree with that? Yes. Um, what I find myself instinctively against is 
going back to 1970 and saying, we must do things like that. Because history has changed. The world has gone round. There is no linear development, as you say. Um, everything in the early 70s seemed to be on an upward path. And we thought there was going to be a complete transformation. By 1981, it was clear there wasn't going to be. And the 1980s, to my mind, was a dark period in our history. Uh, from the early 90s, we could see the beginning of, uh, of change. And from the late 90s into the early 2000s, we see this huge raft of uh, legislative changes, which created, in a sense, the framework for equal citizenship. But legal constitutional equality doesn't mean full equality. So it just brings home to us uh, the need to, in a sense, give detail, give meat to these um, give flowers to avoid meat um, metaphors, um, to actually allow new things to grow within this formal framework. And of course, we know that things aren't perfect, that some things go forward and then go backwards. Um, and um, the trans experience is a good uh, example of this, because in the early 70s, trans people were there right at the beginning. But there were long periods when um, they were forgotten in the, um, in the rise and rise of gay politics. And gay politics often wanted to reject the trans experience, as we know. Um, what I think is, is wonderful in the last 10, 15 years is the way in which the trans experience has been expressed fully um, and that new forms of solidarity um, are have developed. And the fact we use the acronym LGBTQ uh, plus and all the other initials we can add uh, is actually underlining the importance of the sort of coalitionism which was there in the early 70s and which I think is, is there today. Um, and I think, although as we know, these things are often very controversial and arise huge um, um, divisions within what seemed a, a fairly homogeneous movement. I think in, in the end, they uh, are creative. I go back to the 80s and the way in which um, at the end of the 80s, Section 28 was seen and was um, a vicious and undeserved attack on the queer communities. And I think uh, lots of the rhetoric around trans experience today is doing the same thing. We came through that, we'll come through this much stronger. Um, Jeffrey, thank you so much to everybody, whether you want to know about the constructionist theory of sociology, or you want to know some red hot gossip, or if you just want to know how the doors got opened, go out and buy this. It's a really good read. Thank you so much. And I'm handing over to whoever is taking over from me. Thanks ever so much, Liz. Pleasure. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you both um, for that. Uh, my name's Adrian, by the way. I didn't introduce myself right at the beginning of the evening. Um, we're now going to move on to the questions that we've had come in. Um, if Jeffrey and Liz, you're both ready for that. Liz, you might want to contribute as well a little bit. Um, the first one is from, bear with me because I'm, I'm on a computer, so I'm swapping screens a little bit. The first question is in from Jeffrey. Um, what advice would you give to today's young LGBTQ community? And why do you think this advice is important? Um, well, the phrase that comes immediately to mind is do it. Um, the, the crucial thing is um, I grew up, my generation grew up largely closeted. And whatever we did in the early days was always surrounded by the fear of illegality, by the fear of exposure, by the fear of telling our families, uh, the fear of our friends um, finding out, etc. The climate today is, is quite different. Um, there are still risks, but I think what we learned collectively in the early 70s through gay liberation was the importance of 
being true to ourselves, of finding what we wanted to be and being open about it. And that wasn't an easy task. It continues to have difficulties, I, I know. Um, and I wouldn't advise anyone um, to put themselves at dire risk uh, in order to um, just fulfil what I'm saying. But the crucial thing is, unless we do it, unless we are open about our sexuality, the issue is never going to be taken seriously. Coming out in the end was crucial to what has been achieved in the years since the 1970s. Um, and I think it's very important uh, that people feel that they should explore what they want to be in as um, safe and supportive environments as they can. I think what I would say to young people is um, diversity is something to be welcomed, uh, not feared. And we are becoming more and more diverse as a community. Our flag gets more colours and symbols on it, and that's a good thing. We have nothing to fear from each other, or should have nothing to fear from each other. There's no hierarchy between the, the, the different initials. We should really just be big enough to, um, to understand that we're different and cherish that difference. Absolutely. Thank you. So we'll move on to the next question from, uh, from Paul. Have online dating platforms, in your view, encouraged or, sorry, encouraged or destroyed the gay community? I'm a happily married woman, Jeffrey. You're doing this one. I'm a happily married man. So uh, um, this is a bit more abstract than it could be. The, the crucial thing is, in the um, early days, before the 1970s, um, picking up, meeting partners was fairly haphazard. Um, unless you happen to live in a place like London, which had bars and clubs and social networks and so on. From the um, early 70s, the queer world was transformed. Um, in a phrase I quote in the book, the queer world came out and became much more open and diverse. So over the last 40 years, um, we've had that social scene um, in all the major cities and increasingly in in small towns as well. And it all became much more accessible. We had newspapers, we began to get online. But today, if you look at uh, most of the places which were the epicenters of uh, the clubs and so on, Sydney in Australia, London in Britain, Berlin, the clubs still exist, but they're not anymore the epicenter of social life. People do meet online. Um, to an extraordinary extent. Um, and, you know, why not? It exists. Um, and that's led to the breakdown of the old easy um, social networks on the ground. Do I regret it? Yes. But um, do I think it's changed um, the way in which we hook up with other people? Yes, of course. Do I think it's a disaster? I don't think so. Things change and we've got to get used to that change. Again, I make the point, there's no point in looking nostalgically back at a world that's gone forever. Um, what we have to do is uh, find a way of living fruitfully, happily, joyously in the world that exists. And I think that's what uh, online hookups, social networks and so on does. Thank you, Jeffrey, and very neatly skirted there, Liz. <laughs> so the next question is from Ray. Um, as a young man, did Jeffrey identify as queer in a derogatory sense or queer in the sense that young men and women might identify with the term today? Um, really interesting question. Um, and it says something about why I subtitled the book A Queer Boy from the Valleys. Um, I um, first became aware of the derogatory um, meanings of the word queer um, when I got onto a school bus one day, I must have been 14 or so, um, and someone shouted from the back of the bus, are you queer, Jeffrey? 
Um, and I had no real idea of what it meant. Um, I'd never heard it in this context before, but I felt pretty certain that I knew what they were referring to, my sissy, sissiness. Um, and um, I muttered something, but I felt completely marked by this word. Um, and of course it was used derogatory, in a derogatory way. Um, just as a parenthesis here, the guy who shouted that at me many years later in London, um, I met again by accident. And of course he was gay himself, um, but still hadn't fully come out. Um, such are the ironies of history. Um, so I came to London seeing myself as queer. Um, and queer was the use, the word used universally. Gay wasn't used in the 60s very frequently. It existed, but was not used very much. So queer had a derogatory meaning, but it was the word we all used. So it always carried the stigma, um, but we used it nevertheless because no other language, unless you wanted to use the word homosexual really existed. Then of course, gay liberation brought the universal use of, of gay. And it first meant lesbians, trans, um, the whole caboodle uh, that we now describe as LGBTQ plus. Um, but over time, within a couple of years really, it was seen as essentially male term and then became increasingly just the gay male bit um, by and large. And now it's become a universal word all over the world, many different things in different countries. Um, so by the end of the 90s, uh, queer was recovered as a radical word, um, meaning um, the questioning of fixed identities, the questioning of gender and sexual stereotypes, the beginnings of uh, the recognition of, um, of our rich diversity. Um, and looking at history in a different way, not tracing the evolution of a single identity, but looking at the fragmentation of, of identities and so on. Um, um, and for people of my generation, it was a bit of a wrench to um, begin to call ourselves queer again, because it has a different meaning from the term of the 1950s and 60s. Um, but nevertheless, obviously, it's an absolutely critical term. So I used queer in the title of my book because of its very history, because of its ambiguity, because it's meant different things at, uh, at different times. Um, and that's, in a sense, another example of what I wanted to express in the book, the way we live different worlds in different ways and the way our own worlds change over time. Lovely. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, next question comes to us all the way from Esther in Mexico. Um, so we have a little bit of an international audience with us this evening. Um, Esther's question is, um, how do you see yourself beyond the boundaries of your work in the UK? Hello, Esther. Lovely to uh, get your question. Esther's an old friend of mine um, from Mexico, indeed. Um, <laughs> how do I see um, the the important thing is that I um, I'm obviously Welsh. I'm gay and queer. Um, I live in Britain. Um, I am committed to the politics of Britain. I was a strong Europeanist. Um, but I also feel part of the cosmopolitan world that uh, sexual research and, um, and queerness um, and the LGBT world represents. I feel um, identity and um, solidarity with peoples engaged in struggles over human rights, over um, resistance to um, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, and, and so on. And it's through people like um, Esther in Mexico and many others in other countries um, across the world, and my identification and work with them on various projects, that I'm able to feel a citizen of the world. I'm able to feel cosmopolitan, 
um, in my allegiances. Um, and that's very important, again, when we come back home and think of our, our local identities, in my case of my Welshness. Um, um, and one of the things I've learned through my history and through my um, historical contacts in Wales is the degree to which the small isolated community of which I was part was also part of um, uh, an international movement um, of labor, of socialism, of, uh, of singing. Um, uh, one of the earliest family remnants I found was a postcard from an uncle who was sent from the United States where he'd gone with a male voice, voice choir to sing uh, in the 1920s when uh, the South Wales Valleys were um, poverty struck by the um, strikes and Great Depression. Um, so that's always stuck in my mind as an example of how you can forge links over difference, even in the most unlikely circumstances. And that's where I feel uh, our international links does today. Great, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, we've got a question in here from Neil, who's doing a pride talk and quiz to his team on Friday. Um, <clears throat> so, no, that's it's picked up a few tips for some of the questions. Is there one book on queer history that you can recommend they read if they want to know more about the queer journey today? Sorry, the queer journey from whenever to, to today. Um, don't tempt me. Um, I, I have to say, I've written 25 books, um, and my first one was coming out, and a new edition of it came out five years ago for its uh, um, uh, 50, 40th anniversary, um, and there's a good starting point. It's still available, um, but more than just being vain, it also has quite a large bibliography, um, and I think would... Uh, help uh, people. And this also has a reading list, uh, or at least um, citations, which uh, you can um, follow through for historical work. What he said. <laughs> I think, and also there's another 35 titles if you're interested, apparently, so I'd go for that. Uh, next question is from Keith. I'm going to paraphrase this. Um, Keith says he's thinking about the, and I might be mispronouncing the, might be mispronouncing it, the De Emilio et al. thesis? D'Amelio. John D'Amelio, De thank you. Yeah. So to condense it down, is post-capitalism post-queer? Or do you see the post-capitalist future as retaining the LGBT gains of the late capitalist moment? Um, we could spend an evening debating this, or even a week or a month. Um, have, have we have we just walked into a pub in Islington in 1972? I'm just asking for a friend. Go on. <laughs> uh, well, that's the sort of thing we certainly talk about in pubs in the exactly. 1970s in Islington, and indeed in discos. I remember having uh, these heated arguments in in heaven in the late 70s. So you know we. Wherever you are, these are the sort of discussions, and they're important discussions. Um, but, you know, in the question itself, um, was there a connection between uh, capitalism and uh, um, the queer experience? Yes, because there's connection between capitalism and many forms of social and cultural experience. Was it necessary to, is it necessary to have a socialist revolution uh, in order to get uh, change? I certainly believe that in the early 70s. I don't believe it today because the world has changed and we're still in a capitalist uh, society. Are we anywhere near post-capitalism? No, <laughs> we're still deep in the depths of uh, convulsions within uh, uh, international capitalism, which takes many forms in many different uh, um, societies. Um, so personally, I wouldn't say that there's an essential or necessary connection between queer politics and socialist politics. Um, in my own life, um, I've certainly made those connections, but people are able to be um, effective in the world as 
queer politics people um, without being socialists. Um, sadly, there are many socialists in the world who can't recognize the um, importance of queer politics. And that's always been the sticking point for me, I'm afraid. I've very neatly answered there in less than a week. Um, I think probably the final question this evening is coming from David. It might not be quite as challenging for you as the last question, but the question is, what is Jeffrey's secret of eternal youth? When he, gets, I'm going to quote his question here. When I Googled you, I discovered your age. Perhaps the proof that an active mind keeps the body alive and youthful. How kind, how kind is all I can say. Um, the, um, I've been incredibly lucky, touch wood, in my health. I keep active. Um, I, um, not particularly energetically, but, you know, I walk the dog. I do things like that. But the crucial thing is I've always felt able to go on doing my research and writing um, and having a partner who is actually younger than myself and with whom I've developed over 30 odd years now, a very strong um, and ongoing relationship. Um, and the book in many ways, um, in, in certainly the latter part, is about, certainly it's about our life together, but it's also a book uh, constructed in, in a sense together. Um, the, um, sections in the end about our relationship were obviously written in constant discussion with Mark because he was at the centre of, of that. Um, and as Liz very generously said, he's uh, a magnificent, what's the word you use? A magnificent, wonderful, wonderful person. Um, and I can only agree with that. Um, and that's a crucial part in keeping me as uh, young and frisky as I am. Well, I should be, I've been making notes, Jeffrey. I should be following <laughs> I should be following that through. Thank you very much. Thank you both so much, not just for a really interesting evening um, and an insight um, into your life, Jeffrey, but also an insight into the broader world of queer politics and community. Um, I have a little message from, I want to say our sponsor, but we have not any sponsors. Um, a message from Bernadette, who uh, you may all know. Um, we'll be sending out an email to everyone with a code for free delivery of the book for purchase from publisher. So Bernadette will be sending that out within the next day or so, uh, which is great. So next, we're moving over to John Buckerfield, who's our head of fundraising at Opening Doors. I'm, John, I'm assuming you're, you're ready. Um, I am. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. So I just wanted to say thank you to Liz and to every, uh, and to Jeffrey for hosting uh, and kind of talking to us this evening. As a kind of as a younger queer person, it's amazing to hear what you have done for us, uh, and to feel like there's a huge there's still a huge amount that we can do, but that you certainly paved the way for us. Um, I have my own copy of the 40th edition of uh, coming out here, which is heavily uh, read and has many marks in it. So kind of thank you for that. Uh, but I wanted to kind of um, just let everybody know, just kind of thank you for all attending and for watching uh, this evening. Um, if you want to kind of uh, find out a little bit more about what we are doing at Opening Doors in the future, you are more than welcome to join the Friends of Opening Doors newsletter, which I believe you're invited to um, uh, sign up to when you signed up to the event today but if you didn't get a chance to sign up to it and want to find out more please email us at info at openingdoorslondon.org.uk we also are on all of the kind of main social media channels uh, and you can find us at opening doors london uh, and if you wanted to also kind of make a donation in support of the work that we do uh, if you go to the website www.openingdoorslondon.org.uk forward slash donate you'll be able to make a donation there and for anyone who's feeling a little bit more adventurous um, we are going to be doing some fundraising events over the next um, over the next few months or so. Uh, I myself am going to be swimming a mile in the Serpentine in September. Um, so if you fancy joining me in your in my speedos, uh, you'll be more than welcome to do that. Um, just 
and we'll also be doing a number of half marathons and, and also some kind of slightly less adventurous uh, but still meaningful fundraising activities over the next few months. So um, please drop me an email if you would be interested in taking part in any of those. Uh, and we really look forward to hearing from you all soon. We're going to be doing more events like this as well. So uh, keep in touch uh, and we really look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. And I think on that note, am I handing over to Alice now to kind of to sign off or... Uh, Oh, I think you're on mute, Alice. I am, I am. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think it just um, leaves it to me to, to say thank you so much again to Jeffrey and to Liz for um, taking part in, in this evening's event um, and for, for having the conversation for our benefit. Um, I think from the comments that we've had in the chat room, it's been very, very well received and very, very much appreciated. Um, alongside all the work that, uh, that, that you've done um, aside from this evening um, as well. Um, and, and thank you for everyone who's, who's rocked up this evening as well. And uh, you know, great to see so many of you uh, interested in, in uh, what Jeffrey um, has been, uh, done in his life and in the work of opening and supporting Opening Doors. So thank you and uh, have a good rest of the evening which for some I'm sure will be uh, going and watching the, the highlights of uh, England thrashing um, Germany. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Could I thank just you. Thank, uh, thank you all for making this possible and above uh, all to thank Liz for her gentle but penetrating um, um, questioning, which has been great and gave me an opportunity to talk to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.